And uh, so, moving right along, that was a great way to start our conversation about the future. And we now have a tradition of having our first panel be about global capital, which is a broad view of what's going on in the world. And we're uh, really pleased to have back with us again, Megan Morris from Perry, who will lead that discussion. And so with that, Megan, if you'll, uh, you can uh, bring our panelists up and she'll do the introductions. This is a session that we call Debt Equity and Innovation. And we're delighted to have such a great lineup of notable speakers with us again this year. We'll get a sense of where we are and where we're going. So Megan, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks to everyone at MIT for having me back this year. In the next hour, I can't promise that we'll solve intelligence or all of the problems of the world, but I do hope that I can give you a good overview of what's happening globally in terms of capital flows, so innovation, um, risk, and some other issues. My panelists here today come from literally all corners of the world. Um, some of them have traveled quite far to be with <laughs> us and to give us an overview of what's happening in their neck of the woods. Um, they all work with global capital, so this should be a really interesting panel to think through where is money coming from and what does it want to do. Those are the questions that I spend the majority of my time as a senior reporter at the private equity real estate industries magazine okay, I'm thinking through. Um, with that, I would love to hand over to my panelists for a quick introduction. If you could tell us who you are and what type of capital you're investing, that would be helpful as we open up the discussion. Dennis, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, my name is Dennis Lopez. I'm the CEO of a company called Quadril. Um, basically, Quadril is a company that was um, put together, in fact, we're just completed two weeks ago by the uh, pension fund for British Columbia uh, up in Canada. And we invest, um, we have a portfolio of about 25 billion. We're looking to grow to 50 billion and it's long-term capital for the pensions of about 650,000 workers in the province, policemen, firemen, teachers. I am Isabel Semama, CEO of AXA IM Real Asset. Um, so AXA IM Real Asset is the um, real estate uh, and infrastructure uh, asset management arm of the AXA Group. We manage 76 billion of assets uh, through what we call the four quadrants, meaning we are investing in direct properties, in direct infrastructure, but also in the private debt market, listed uh, and listed market debt and equities. And we manage more or less half of uh, uh, the capital we manage is on behalf of AXA, so insurance companies, and the balance is on behalf of pension funds and insurance company and several wealth funds. We also have a business for uh, uh, retail clients. Thanks. Hi, my name's Leonie Wilkinson. I'm an investment specialist with QIC, which is Queensland Investment Corporation, and I support our global real estate business within QIC. QIC started around about 1992 as the investment arm of the Queensland State Treasury of Australia. We've grown that over time to really focus on unlisted alternative investments on behalf of our original incumbent government investors and also third party capital investors similar to AXA. These days we have $65 billion under management, primarily in Australia and the US, and about half of that is for the Queensland government and half is for third party capital. Hi everyone, my name is Emmanuel Adu. I uh, run the blockchain and distributed ledger practice at Credit Suisse. Um, function there really focuses on uh, a few things, actually public policy advice. So we, we talk to our regulators about blockchain and influence their decision making on what is blockchain, crypto, ICOs, etc. Um, we uh, run a number of proof of concepts and uh, pilots actually at this stage uh, within the firm and, and across our clients as well. Um, I also uh, do lead the investment for the bank's balance sheet in, in startups that uh, impact and affect um, the credit Suisse as well. Um, so it's kind of an exciting role actually. So blockchain is daily in the, in the press and um, always exciting. Thanks all. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you all to open your phones. Um, that's something you don't hear at conferences very often. And make sure you're using the MIT application. I have this iPad up here to monitor questions. And while as a journalist, I could spend hours asking uh, my panelists some questions, we would also love to hear from you. So I'll take questions throughout our session. Let's get started and think big picture. 
For those of you, especially maybe Leone, who are going out and trying to find capital, is it more difficult right now to source capital or to deploy it right now? What are you seeing in your many travels? You've been around the world just in the past couple of days, it sounds like. We have, yeah. I've traveled. I've been in the US for the last um, week and, and a bit. Um, more difficult to source or deploy capital. I think we focus primarily on Australian capital. So I might talk about that for a couple of minutes just because um, perhaps that's interesting for this audience um, given it's the other side of the world. So we have a, a very, very strong source of capital in Australia and, and that part of it, I think to answer your question would be relatively easier than deploying it. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that's the case. So the source of capital for QIC is really heavily weighted to Australian pension funds. And the distinct differentiators for that source of capital and, and why it's a relatively easier area to tap is because of our size. We're one and a half trillion dollars under management just in Australia, which for context is um, on different measures, either the third or fourth largest pension fund pool in the world. We sit behind the US and the UK, but we're around about the same size as Canada and the Netherlands in terms of the source of capital. It's also growing very strongly. We have universal and mandated contributions into our pension fund system and we have since the early 1990s. And that contribution level is going to grow. It's already been legislated that that will grow over time. But most of our gains are really from capital gains in the existing investments that we have. So looking out over time, we're projecting strong growth and we actually don't have a line of sight to when our net outflows will be positive. We're seeing inflows from contributions and capital gains out into the foreseeable future. So what that means is that we have a large pool of long dated capital that we can work with. The second really differentiating feature of our capital pool is that it's a defined contribution pool, which means that the risk and return of the investments made by us on behalf of the members is at the risk of the retirees themselves, which means we're very uh, low risk investors and long dated investors. So that means that we can invest into real assets that tend to have a little bit less liquidity. Um, we have the luxury of a lot of flexibility in the way that we invest and that opens up lots of opportunities for us around the world. But that brings us to the conundrum of how do we then deploy the capital that we have. We're in this wonderful position where we have a lot to, to work with. How do we deploy that in a good way that's going to help our, our members? We think back about what are their objectives and what are they trying to achieve. And really, to, have, to give a retiree dignity in their retirement, we want capital preservation as key. We don't want to lose the money that they've given us to invest. And we also want to keep up with GDP growth. So we're looking for investments where we can have a, a core or core plus income, a uh, core or core plus total return risk profile, but then income that's going to be able to track GDP growth. I spend a lot of time working with opportunistic managers, um, but we have a different profile on stage here. Um, Dennis, can you speak about what type of uh, risk return strategy you're looking at, um, given that you're also investing on behalf of um, retirees eventually? Sure. Um, well, as I've indicated, uh, Quadro is a new company, so um, and um, it's it's uh, you know it's not often you get a chance to to be part of a twenty five billion dollar startup. <laughs> it's being given an additional twenty five billion to grow in the next six years. Uh, the mandate is to be a global investor. So traditionally, BCI has had more of I think the approach that you've laid out, Leona. I think we're going to adjust that slightly, or I know we are, um, and that is is that we're going to really look at it that we've got twenty five billion of capital going to 50, and then how do we maximize the returns on that taking appropriate risk? So we will have a component of the portfolio, which is stable assets, uh, longer term for cash flow. But I think we're also very much thinking too that, um, we'll talk about this more, that with all the technological change that I guess we'll get into a bit and was highlighted in the keynote address, there's gonna be a lot more obsolescence going forward. So we have to be much more careful in the opportunity, and, and just kind of you know buying a massive office building in London or New York and just sitting on it really doesn't work anymore. So we're going to be much more active in turning over our portfolio. Uh, one of the other things too is is that um, you know just buying low and selling high it sounds good but it's hard to do and you need a volatile economy for that. If you look at the world 
particularly since back to 1977 when the central banks around the world started focusing inflation uh, as well as uh, job growth and GDP growth as targets, the volatility of, of the world has dr been dramatically decreased through interest rates uh, and through asset values too. So um, one of the things that we're focused on is creating more operating businesses. So two sectors we like a lot and we'll talk about more, industrial multifamily, their cash flows tend to be much more stable, uh, they're much more diverse uh, tenant populations, but they involve a, a high level of operations, but that's okay. If you get good at it, we think it'll allow you to outperform. If you take the traditional uh, institutional investment, let's say an office building, you have a, a billion or two billion dollar office property in London, New York, Paris, um, you know, you've, if a tenant of two or three hundred thousand square feet leaves, uh, the capex required to reposition that space and bring in a new tenant, you get very volatile cash flows, which frankly aren't as attractive for us. So a few, few thoughts on how we're trying to maybe change the pension fund model a bit. Isabel, when you're looking at Axe's massive portfolio, is it easier right now to buy or to sell? You're sitting on a lot of money, but you also have a, a pretty substantial portfolio. Um, so how are you thinking about buying versus selling in this environment? Uh, I, I will share a little bit what, uh, what uh, Denise, uh, Denise has said. Um, the, 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 the issue today um, is, is more embracing what the, the disruption we see globally in the industry. So to switch and to adapt the portfolio, so we have to buy and to sell in order to, um, to, to rebalance the portfolio toward what we call uh, alternative, uh, alternative asset classes. So we do a lot in logistics, uh, in senior housing, student housing, residential. Uh, those sectors that benefit from very sound fundamentals and, uh, and uh, in which uh, uh, we can expect some uh, good cash flow, steady cash flow and uh, cash flow to, to grow over time. And we rebalance and readjust uh, our uh, more traditional portfolio, so that is made of uh, offices and, uh, and retail. But uh, I, I, fully, uh, I fully agree with what Denise has said. The issue we see across the industry is the obsolescence. The fact that uh, when you look at the office market, the demand from tenants is changing a lot. Uh, they are uh, generally moving from one office space to another one with uh, a ratio of 0 0.8, 0 0.7, or 0 0.6, meaning that they are reducing the surfaces they are, uh, they are looking for, but they are ready to move not always to pay the right rent or the one we would like to, to we, we would expect, but they, they, they move and, uh, and require more technology, more modern, more flexible uh, building, but reducing the, the, the number of square meters they use. So these are things that are impacting dramatically the industry, significantly the industry, and that we have to, uh, to, uh, to take into account. So another thing we do a lot is we, we do a lot of development. We do some development with, uh, with Dennis in London, notably, uh, because uh, coming to the market with the right new product, with product that offer all the technology, all the um, uh, services tenants are, uh, are expecting, either way, to deal with this office market that is becoming uh, riskier because of the, accelerates, uh, the, the acceleration of uh, obsolescence. We've talked a little bit um, from our first session and now about office, but I want to think about um, obsolescence in retail, which is something that comes up day in and day out with my meetings, particularly with investors. I'm seeing a lot of state public pension plans and other groups with significant capital to deploy saying, we just won't touch retail right now. We have the allocation, but it's not something we're looking to do in any um, area. Retail is a big property type, so should we read into those headlines and say bricks and mortar are dead and it'll be all Amazon Prime from now on, or are there still some opportunities? Leonie, you do a lot of retail, so tell me what you're thinking through at QIC. We do. We do a lot of retail, and the reason we do a lot of retail is because historically retail has provided the best hedge against inflation, and we like to be able to do that for the members sitting in our pension funds. So we are continuing to do what we do. I do think that retail at the moment is undergoing uh, a renaissance. Um, and the reason for that is really driven by technology. I think that's going to come up over and over over the course of this conference. But we, um, we, are, we see the headlines the same as everybody else. Um, I, I agree that e-commerce and retailer health are headwinds for the retail industry. And I understand why people are concerned about deploying money into capital. As a, a specialist in retail, we, t we think it's dangerous to concentrate just on that aspect of retail without looking at the fuller picture. And 
we typically would start thinking about retail from a macroeconomic perspective and that starts with the health of the consumer. And the health of the consumer is, is in very, very good shape. We talked earlier, Eric talked to us about median incomes and while the median income of households has flattened out, we're looking, if we look at what the growth of consumer spending is going to be over the next 10 years, it's actually going to be in the US 4.8% um, per annum, which is a 400 basis points higher than the last decade where it's 3.8 percent per annum. So that's where we start. We think about the consumer and then we think about how much of that spending growth is going to be sent, spent in retail centres. The really simple way for me to think about the impact of e-commerce and retailer health is that when some spending is taken away from say a retailer that um, has gone into bankruptcy or has shifted from bricks and mortar into e-commerce. It's not that that spending disappears and, and goes into the ether, the spending goes somewhere. So that's what we're focusing on. And as landlords who wanna do a good job for our investors, we need to understand what does that consumer want? And that's where the, the very interesting intersection with technology is helping us as a retail landlord because we have historically always focused on consumer health, the demographics around our, our shopping centres. You know, we consider them actually local businesses and we're hyper local in the way that we tap into our consumers. But now with technology, there's many different ways and, and some have already been touched on that we can better understand our consumer. And it's really incumbent on us as the landlord to assist um, our retailers to understand their consumer and give the consumer what they want. And just as a quick um, data point, I hope that gives a little bit more context, but it's just to start to think through some of the headlines. They're focusing on um, retailers that are going broke and the impact of e-commerce. But if you just dig a little bit deeper, there's many other statistics that can help counter some of that. And one that I just wanted to call out because I thought it was really relevant um, when we were talking earlier about the bifurcation of household incomes, who's doing well and who's not doing quite so well in the US. Retailers um, that can respond to that are surviving and actually thriving. And retailers that aren't responding to that situation that consumers are finding themselves in are the ones that aren't um, able to survive in this market. And that really is focusing on those mid-market balanced retailers. The premium retailers have net new stores and actually price-based retailers have very significant net new stores. So I thought that was just a nice intersection with some of the comments that were made earlier. So, so maybe I'll just make a quick comment. I think um, from our perspective, our peers, 35% of their portfolios in real estate, for us it's 10. And we're very happy with it there and maybe even less. And um, the retail that we do isn't really, quote, retail for, per se, it's densification. Um, if you think about it, you've got a lot of properties, particularly here in North America, where you've got 30, 40, 50 acres in prime centers of, of wealth um, and transportation nodes, and you've got huge parking lots and single-story buildings. Okay, so that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So what we, uh, what we think the primary opportunity in retail is is to take those centers and densify them. So for example, we've got a mall in Vancouver. It's worth about a billion dollars. It's got 30 acres. Uh, we're going to throw another 3.7 billion into it, take, make it the second city center of Vancouver, uh, put in 2,000 apartments, nine towers around the site, increase the retail from 400 to 900,000, increase the office from 100 to 400,000. It's on um, the major transportation node from the airport to downtown. We like those kind of projects. We think that's the future, these big mixed-use projects that, you know, it's work-life play. You guys have heard those themes before. So if you take a look at the department stores, effectively, we kind of think they're dead, they're gone. Um, and, um, and if you take a look at e-commerce, really, where's the future of e-commerce? We think it's actually China. If you take a look at China right now, all in North America, we think we're kind of leading retailing, right? Okay. 53% uh, of e-commerce is in China, not in North America. They're five times bigger than us. And effectively what they've done is they've skipped malls. Now, of course, they do have malls there. But if you take a look at their percentage of retail and malls versus e-commerce, they've effectively skipped it. Just like, you know, when I first went to Europe, I had my brick Motorola uh, telephone. And then when I would go to Japan, I had, you know, just unbelievably, you know, incredibly much better. So I think that, um, I think, you know, from our perspective, you know, one of the advantages of being a global investor is to kind of look around the world and see who's doing what. And, you know, so 
We think retail is mainly an opportunity for that great land that they've been able to tie up, you know, 40, 50 years ago. What are some of the... You have also spent seven years in, uh, in Europe, in France, <laughs> <laughs> Europe. And, and, but, but just one very short comment. When talking about retail, we also have to look at the, the shape of the market. If you look at Europe, the, the, the number of square meters in retail is five times less than in, in the US. So that's that exactly is the dimension right. we have to, uh, to consider. And we are probably in the middle, because if I look at the portfolio, 16% of it, 16 of it is, uh, is retail, so it's, but it is 9 billion, so it's quite, it's quite big. And what we have done, you were asking about um, buying and selling. Uh, we have definitely uh, sold all the shop, sh uh, small shopping centers, small, uh, the ones that are not in the key, uh, key area. But focusing on the very large shopping center and the, 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 the best location, high street location, those ones continue to perform well. So location remains one uh, critical uh, issue for, uh, for retail and for uh, to have, uh, and partnering also with the right operator when talking to that's, shopping center. That's right. It's a North American opportunity. Uh, Europe doesn't have the same issue. We're way over retail and, um, and there's going to be big winners and losers. I was up in Dennis's neck of the woods a few weeks ago talking to folks up in Canada, and one guy made the point that Canada is not over-retailed, but the U.S. is under-demolished. So that could lead to some opportunity um, for some repositioning um, of the mixed-use centers, um, call centers, medical offices, all sorts of interesting things. Um, how does technology play a role in the retail revolution? Leonie, you do some work around um, using consumer data and things like that. Um, I think that that's a much more interesting way than just opening your doors and hope people come in. Oh, yeah. So yeah. how does technology play a role in how you're bringing consumers in the door and then, um, not to sound like Big Brother, but tracking them as they move through retail centers? Yeah. yeah, no, you definitely can't just open the doors and hope that people will come in. You'll be <laughs> out of business quite quickly. So. Um, Historically, we looked at demographics around a shopping centre to understand um, primarily how the, the growth of income in our catchment area would be over the coming years and, and really focus in on those target areas. And now that has evolved using technology into um, a, a term that can be summarised as consumeristics. And really that's about just really understanding as best we can our consumer and what they're looking for and make sure that our offer is appropriate for the consumer and make sure that we're supporting our retailers to give them the offer that they're looking for. And so one specific example that I'll just walk through and Eric actually touched on it, um, but I'll talk about how we use it in Australia because it's kind of interesting um, with our market being different to the US in some ways. So we look at, we have a partnership with a, a bank in Australia to look at credit card transaction data. And when I first learned about this, it was a little um, disconcerting because I felt like big brother. And I thought, well, how much is it really appropriate, appropriate for us to know about this level of data? So the first thing I just wanted to highlight is that it is all anonymized. It's not um, <laughs> breaching any privacy laws. And it's a very commercial um, enterprise in Australia. And I think the reason I wanted to particularly share this um, with this audience is because in Australia, it's able to give us very rich data because we only have four major banks in Australia. So a partnership with one bank gives you access to around about one quarter of the transactions that happen in Australia. So we can look at and analyse credit card transactions. And what that means is that for consumers in the catchment areas of our shopping centres, we can look at what they're buying and where they're buying it from. So historically, we were able to understand from many of our retailers in the shopping centres what the foot traffic was like and what the revenue and sales were like. But this credit card transaction data lets us see exactly which brands our consumers like and where they're buying from buying those brands and that includes online. So the way that we then can use that data is if we can see that consumers in our catchment area like a particular brand and we don't have it in our shopping centre, we'll look to make sure that we can bring it into our shopping centre. And also if they like a brand and they're buying it, but they're not buying it at our shopping centre, maybe they're buying it at a competitor or they're buying it online, we'll work with our retailer to support the offer that they have in our centre and make sure that it's attractive and that the consumers can start coming in and buying the product um, from us. So I thought that was a good, there's many, many examples. We have an entire digital strategy that we're rolling out, but I thought that was um, a very interesting one and a little unique to um, Australia in the way that we uh, use it. 
Emmanuel, tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing with blockchain. Um, I can tell you from my talks with many um, sovereign wealth funds and other, I would say, slightly old school money managers, there's not a lot of interest in commercial <laughs> real estate and blockchain, but it seems like we're on the forefront, uh, maybe on the cusp of some change. So tell me about the work that you're doing with Credit Suisse and the opportunities you see, particularly in commercial real estate. Um, yeah, sure. I think for us at CS, I mean, we I run pro proof of concepts for the last three and a half years um, on using blockchain technology, and we were... I'll tell you an interesting story, I think, about real estate or structured products, which is where we do our wholesale lending. Um, we, we started off in loans. My background, actually, is um, I ran leverage finance technology for Credit Suisse for 11 of my 20 years there. Um, so we, had a, we started off in syndicated loans, and we got things, things going on in FX. And I noticed that we, we didn't have an, uh, a project in real estate, didn't know much about structured products at all, so spent some time kind of learning the, 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 the workflows of, of uh, kind of going back to the example earlier in terms of the workflows of what people do. Uh, and it turns out that um, we, we, Credit Suisse, for instance, make a lot of money in the inefficiency of, of, the, of the business, um, which is bad, for <laughs> good and bad, it's great for us, but bad when I, tell it, when I finish the story. Um, so we make money in this something called the wet period, so the period between signing and it arri documents arriving at the custodian. One of the things blockchains do, is they, they, we codify operational processes, so we make things, um, aut we automate things in, in, from a contract perspective. But we also, and the big kicker is, we try to take, make a blockchain application uh, decrease settlement. So what happens when you go when you move from a from a place where you're charging you know uh, a retailer a couple of extra basis points actually 200 basis points for the wet period and you shrink that down um, to a day when everyone's digitally signing um, on the same day every there's there's, there's no lack there's no um, lead time anymore uh, that goes away so I, I shared that with the head of our business and he said well why would we want to do this I said <laughs> we won't do this but I guarantee if we've thought about it others are going to think about it too. Um, so you be prepared for that. Um, we've done an experiment uh, with a couple of our, uh, actually it came to us from one of a, we're a financier and um, actually we published it so I can talk about it, US Bank, Wells Fargo, uh, Whamco and um, U uh, was it? I think it was us actually. Um, US Bank played the role of treasurer of the trustee as well as the ser our service or SPS. And what we found was we were doing this work um, moving the service that was basically collecting lots of data and, and holding it for 30 days and or, it, the inefficiency was was tremendous what we did on the blockchain I mean blockchains are really just database technologies that allow us to share information through our firewalls um, knowing that the other person your counterpart is looking at the exact same data you are um, so we're able to actually shrink that whole process down have everyone on the same page in terms of the servicing elements of what was on, on, the, on the, uh, the, tra the transactions instantaneously. Taking that same model, putting it into asset-backed securities and for, for our credit card processing, et cetera, just makes the whole process much more automatable. And then what we're seeing uh, now is using smart contracts to effectively create um, what we, the mortgage pool, effectively ensuring we've always got, say, the AAA at the top, uh, taking out, you know, because in a mortgage pool, you get the product, you, uh, the mortgage disappears and you've got to replace it for, you know, for, your, for your client. That process completely automated using smart contracts. So that's, that's a touch of what we're seeing in the real estate piece. I think there are some people in New York who are very nervous looking at blockchain um, in the third party service providers like the title insurance industry, which um, goes very deep into New York and then Albany upstate as well <laughs> in terms of the political reach. So I think that there are some opportunities in real estate. What will it take for some of the more institutional managers to think through blockchain adoption um, at the enterprise level? You know, I think the, the challenge um, the challenge I find is that there's this blockchain's been on, this, on certainly been talked about a lot since 2015, and it was I would say 2015 was the year of hype. Uh, 2016 might have been the year of the POC, and uh, what does that make 2018? I guess the year of the pilot. Um, but I definitely feel as though it's been a case of prove it. Um, it's the, the, the what the projects that I work on, uh, and with us 16 in our portfolio in total. 
um, promise a cost reduction of 50% in our processing or more. Some of them are as high as 86% cost re reductions. And when you think about those numbers, it always surprises me that you know, people aren't literally biting your hand off to, to adopt. Mm -hmm. So I think some of the challenges are that you, know, uh, it's, y you kind of have to prove it. You have to show that it works. And I think the first pilots, uh, the first things that go to production, maybe later on this year, next year, will force uh, managers to start really looking at it. I don't find um, blockchain terribly investable. Um, in the short term, um, from, a, from a banking perspective, let's back up, it is investable, but it's hard to see the exits. I think people are, uh, uh, view you know, blockchain as an expense reduction mechanism as opposed to a, a revenue opportunity. I think that's likely wrong. Um, we're seeing um, initial coin offerings, ICOs, as a new way to fund real estate projects, for instance. So, you know, folks in this room who put capital to work at uh, for, for the purchases of um, a construction. That's a new model that I think is, is going to uh, take, take hold. Um, so, you know, I, I think people should pay attention. I think the technology is on its way. It's not going anywhere. And it will have a dramatic impact on not just the, imp the improvements in our, uh, in our businesses, but also, you know, and how we look at um, funding new projects. One of the best parts of running this panel um, is such diverse perspectives from all over the world. And so we had a couple of audience questions um, on getting some foreign opinions here. So for the group, what are some current trends you're seeing with foreign investment in the US? Um, some of you are very active here. So what does the US look like um, from a foreign perspective? What are some of the, uh, the headwinds we're facing right now and maybe some opportunities as well? Uh, I can come on it. So, um, so basically, um, yeah, there's always um, the new kid on the block that's looking for to expand. Um, you know, we've um, seen it over time. I mean, lots of capital coming in from the Middle East at one point, Scandinavia, Europe, um, wherever. Um, lately, it's been Asia, um, and um, you know, we're all hearing lots about the Chinese. Um, that's kind of shifted. Initially, it was really more the sovereigns. It was the CICs and the Safeco's. Who are investing? They've, they've, they're still active, but they've stepped back a bit. It's really more now a lot of the high net worths from Asia. So you're seeing these very aggressive prices being discussed and paid. But frankly, the the number of people behind is fairly small. So the headline looks good, but maybe there's only two or three people on a bid, whereas there were ten. So um, I'd say generally, um, this is a bit technical, but the fertile laws in the U.S. don't help anything. They've modified them a bit so that some people qualify as pension funds. But generally, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of capital out there. I think you know, the, the issue now is finding good projects. Um, so the U.S. has always been, the U.S. represents 40% of the investable institutional quality assets in the world. Um, it's it's a, whenever anybody thinks of investing whatever part of the world you're from, typically London's first, uh, then probably New York and Paris are next in terms of the three cities that they come to. And um, so what I would say right now is it's, 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 it's fine. There's plenty of capital out there for, for investments in the U.S. The real issue is kind of finding things that um, will perform well through the recession when it comes. But what we, find, we, we are investing on the three continents, so the U.S., even if we are a bigger player in, in Europe and, and in Asia, what we see uh, is that the large investors continue to, to deploy capital in the U.S., but at this time of the cycle, Europe benefits also from a lot of traction because it is lagging behind the U.S., behind Asia in terms of cycle, and especially within Europe, uh, continental uh, Europe, more than the U.K. The U.K. Uh, the UK is, uh, is, uh, is, of course, affected by the Brexit, but looking at continental Europe, there is, a, there is a lot of capital coming there from North America and also from Asia. Uh, the Asian capital continue to be very, very active. Uh, and now after the Chinese, the Korean, you have the, the Japanese uh, that uh, have a tremendous uh, amount of capital to deploy. So they continue to invest locally in Asia, they invest in Australia, uh, but, uh, but uh, they are also uh, start, they start to invest a lot in, uh, in, uh, in Europe and notably in continental Europe. 
Leonie, generally speaking, what do Australian investors want to do um, outside? I'm speaking with mm -hmm. quite a uh, few superannuation funds that are really interested in Europe right now. Um, I thought that the U.S. would be their first kind of hotspot, but quite a few of them are more interested in Western Europe and what's going on on the continent. So what are you seeing broadly from Australia? I think for Australians have a very strong domestic bias to Australia for real estate investment. And it, really, it's because we've had this wonderful investing environment for a long time. Our returns have been very good. The pension fund industry is highly fragmented. So while there are a small number of larger funds, and they are growing, that hold a lot of the wealth, there's a very long tail of small pension funds in Australia that really, for them to make a decision to invest offshore into real estate is a lot of work for, why would they really need to do that when they've got this terrific um, domestic real estate? platform that they can come into. I think there's certainly interest. Um, the reason why it's been a little bit more focused on Europe than the US is I think there's a perception that Europe is a little behind the US in terms of asset pricing. So it's, it's difficult for pension funds to put money overseas in this cycle at what we believe to be the top of the cycle because many pension funds from Australia did that last cycle and were burnt badly. I think the situation was quite different because to go offshore they were seeking higher returns. They're coming away from that core and core plus risk profile and looking for more value add opportunistic returns. Really if they'd invested into that risk profile anywhere in the world at that point in the cycle they were likely to have not done too well but because it was concentrated into offshore markets in that risk profile it was a bad experience so i think really this time around they're very pragmatic very careful and don't and want to avoid putting capital into fully priced markets i think bringing it back to the us what and, and what qic we specifically see in, in the us as attractive is um without wanting to um come in and, and tell the US how to do retail. There's absolutely no way um, that we want to give that um, perception at all. But we have been doing it successfully to, for 25 years in Australia. And, and the differences that we see in the US and the reason we're attracted to US retail is that there's two main dynamics. The first is the department stores and anchors that own their boxes. That's a little different to Australia. And also the merchandising mix, the US um, environment where you have a very high concentration of apparel retailers, for example, is very different to what we have in Australia and many parts of Asia, where it's a much more balanced mix of um, apparel and a much heavier weighting to experiential retail, which we think is going to be a very important part of successful retailing into the future, as we've touched on earlier, um, as it relates to use of technology and so on. So that's really, um, yeah, our perspective from Australia. Emmanuel, as you're surveying the global tech scene, uh, maybe accepting Silicon Valley, where are some hot spots in terms of blockchain development or people doing interesting things in fintech from your perspective? Um, yeah, it's interesting actually. Uh, I, I think the US actually, uh, I think Bitcoin maximists around the world will hate me for saying so, but I think the US actually leads. Um, the other hot spots uh, I see are uh, the UK. Um, I know um, Credit Suisse and I, we should say Zug trying to become crypto, uh, crypto alley as they call themselves. Um, so I, I see hotspots um, for blockchain around, you know, around those particular centers. I'd say one just thing, uh, just tagging on to Leonie's comments, I think um, one of the, so, some of the projects that we see, um, you know, I, I think ICOs, ICOs are basically, I mentioned before, initial coin offerings built on top of Ethereum, which is another block type of blockchain, public blockchain. I see ICOs as the, 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 the next invention on top of Bitcoin. Bitcoin was 2009, uh, and that, was, that took over the, you know, our, our, our thoughts and how we could change capital markets, but ICOs are the next. And what I'm seeing as well uh, is the digitization of illiquid assets, um, like real estate. Um, I, I saw a company from Silicon Valley looking at uh, digitizing unrefined gold, i.e. gold still in the ground. Um, and uh, using the uniform UCC uh, out of Delaware to, to do the, the lean process on that. Um, we're seeing uh, companies uh, in, in Switzerland looking at um, uh, art uh, and digitizing and tokenizing that, allowing people to access different types of asset, um, asset classes that they wouldn't normally uh, look at before. So, um, yeah, I think there's, there's a really interesting play when it comes to the technology, how, it actually, how you use blockchain, AI, and everything else coming together to form different types of investment products. Big picture, what would be the benefit for an ICO versus just a traditional commingled fund structure that some of us know fairly well? 
Yeah, you know, the interesting thing about the ICO, I'm going to talk about the US for a second, um, because there's, some, there's this tension between the SEC, the regulator, and, and, and the ICO, and, and now you're finding people saying, oh, we're not, to, to avoid going to jail um, for doing an ICO and not declaring it with the SEC, they're now registering as, you know, either a Reg D or Reg A plus or whatever. Uh, and, and that causes some interesting tension because if it's a registered asset, therefore held a custodian versus this ICO, which is supposed to live and breathe on the blockchain, you know, how do I reconcile those two things together? And, and they call them STOs now. Uh, and interestingly, what I'm finding is people, uh, the, the next batch of ICOs uh, or STOs will instantiate directly, uh, I think some of you might remember or know about Delaware and, and Wyoming as well, uh, doing some you know, interesting things around their laws to ensure that whatever's on the blockchain is actually in law as well. So that's good. what you really care about is in case of bankruptcy, who do I, what's the judge gonna uh, rule against who owns what? So being able to actually um, use that Delaware law um, to create a, a, a product, like say if I picked a Reg A+, which doesn't have the same restrictions as a Reg D, uh, 2,000 participants, US, etc. But it, now you can trade it instantly in the secondary market using a Reg A plus format. Um, I, I think that's going to open a whole new wave of, of investment vehicles uh, for this audience as well as others. I want to switch topics just a little bit to um, another area of innovation or another area of capital deployment that's very popular right now in the private world, and that's real estate debt. Um, Isabel, that's something that you spend a lot of time focusing on. How is debt playing a role in portfolios now compared with equity, and how are you structuring portfolios on behalf of your clients to find the right balance of risk um, and yield in this market environment? So if uh, I look at what we manage, uh, 15, uh, we have 15 billion of uh, private debt, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite significant. Uh, most of the investors uh, that invest in our program, they look at this investment as a, uh, a diversification for their fixed income portfolio. So it's more a fixed income approach and they are lo looking at what kind of spread they can get compared to, uh, to what they get on the bond market. So, uh, so it has always been the case. It is part of their fixed income allocation and they continue to, uh, in, in the current market, they continue to allocate and, uh, and our program continue to grow both, both in infrastructure and real estate uh, because we still, in, in Europe and in the US, the, margin are, the, the, the pricing are not so different. We continue to offer premium between 50 to 100 bips compared to what they get on the bond market, which makes sense at a time where interest rates are still, uh, still, still low. Um, when looking, uh, going up the, the, the risk curve, uh, we are at the time of the cycle where looking at the mezzanine market becomes more and more challenging. So we, in, in regarding our allocation, we uh, refocus really on senior loans, on uh, so that are even more uh, a proxy for uh, for uh, for fixed income, uh, and uh, we, we we reduce the level of risk and uh, and look only at the senior uh, senior market, knowing that the mezzanine piece are the ones that are stuck between. Uh, equity and debt and uh, in the downturn will be the, the first to be, uh, to, be, to be impacted. So we are at a time of the cycle where we tend to, to, to reduce uh, the level of risk, but we continue to, uh, to, get, uh, to attract uh, this program, this uh, private debt program continue to, uh, to attract a lot of uh, demand. And we are more in a situation where we cap the capital we raise because we don't want to be a, a forced buyer uh, in a market that also uh, remain, uh, remain challenging with uh, with an asset class that uh, is, uh, is, is expensive. So, uh, but uh, uh, maybe one uh, additional comment regarding the way we build portfolio. So we have this 360 approach. So we are present on private and public market and equity and debt. And for us, it's uh, highly valuable because it's a way to have a, uh, an insight, a market insight that is really powerful. And uh, especially at this time of the cycle where everything is expensive, being capable to move up and down the capital structure to look at private and public market is a, is a fantastic market uh, insight and allow us to uh, be more um, agile in, uh, in our underwriting, for, uh, notably for uh, private assets. So uh, we, we do a lot of uh, brainstorming and exercise, uh, benchmarking, uh, benchmarking private and, uh, and public pricing, uh, capital and debt, uh, just to, uh, to have a better assessment of, uh, of pricing and uh, be better in our uh, underwriting. 
For both the debt and equity sides, um, for all of you, how are you thinking about emerging markets right now? Are those markets that you would like to be in? We'll leave the specifics of what's hot in Mexico and things like that to our later sessions um, on some of those emerging markets in particular. But um, do you tend to be in more developed countries, or is there interest in going elsewhere? Dennis, let's start with you. You have quite a big program to build out. Will any of that capital find a home in emerging markets? So um, we're focused on eight countries, uh, Canada, the US, France, Germany, uh, Japan, China, and Australia. And that represents about 84% of the investable institutional quality real estate in the world. So that's kind of our initial focus. Um, the issue with the emerging markets, um, one of them, uh, well, first is rule of law. So we're very focused on contracts, right? We have contract releases, contracts for, for title of land. And uh, that's an issue, frankly, in a lot of the emerging markets. They may have very high GDP growth rates, look very attractive. Uh, as you all know, there's a massive correlation to GDP growth to real estate values, but it doesn't do any good if, um, if you can't enforce your contracts. Um, the second thing is just more specific, it's the cost of hedging. So our returns are judged on the Canadian dollar. When we go to India, it costs us 5% to hedge. And even then, we're only hedging just the equity, not the cash flows, the capital appreciation. You know, I know that's one of the issues of going from Europe to Australia. It used to cost about two and a half percent. That's expensive, you know. So especially in an environment where returns are lower, you know, you're looking at, you know, yields sub five or something like that. If you're paying those kind of, if you have those kind of costs, then, um, then it's, um, then, you know, it, it's pretty difficult. With that said, uh, we're dabbling in Mexico. Our, our, our strongest global theme is uh, logistics, kind of the opposite of the retail story. So we're dabbling in logistics in Mexico, and we're also dabbling in logistics in India. Um, by the way, we don't consider China an emerging market. <laughs> we think it's emerged. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so we put that, even though some people wouldn't say it's not a developed country, we feel that way, and we feel it's an important country for us to invest in. Yes, but rebounding on what you are saying, China, if we put China aside, uh, when you look at the emerging market, it's a lot of small market or compared to the big markets uh, that are quite, they are quite small. And real estate, it's a lot about uh, 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 generating value. It's, uh, it's, uh, it requires a lot of human resources, asset management. So it's also challenging. I, I subscribe to everything that has been said by Denis regarding uh, uh, rule of law, currency hedging. But on the top of that, you have how you deploy and how you organize yourself in those countries that are mm -hmm. each of them quite small compared to what can the, the, the rest of the, the market can offer. And it's, it's really also a, a setup issue, how you, you, you set up yourself to, 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 to manage assets and to, uh, to be close to, to, to your property or to your, to your program. So on our side, we, we stick to the, to, to the, to the developed countries uh, and uh, are not considering to, uh, to deploy capital in the emerging market. I've heard a lot about blockchain applications for some of those very emerging markets that lack um, title registry systems, um, deed transfer, things like that, um, that help with the rule of law. Emmanuel, are you seeing anything in the emerging markets, or are you more focused on um, what's coming out to help kind of the existing financial institutions? Yeah, our, our, my key focus is really working on what the banking, you know, the capital markets piece. I, I, I probably met with. 200 plus startups uh, in my journey, um, and they focus on various things, and many of them do focus on uh, blockchain, using also uh, another invention, IoT, um, the Internet of Things, to do things around logistics, tracking on the blockchain. Um, not That's not us, that's Wells Fargo, did an experiment on that um, recently. Uh, I, I see things happening in Venezuela, uh, things happening in, um, in uh, say Nairobi, it's Kenya, uh, and, and Nigeria on blockchain as well, so to do with real estate in particular. Um, but I, I don't know how well that will stand up in rule of law, because that's really what it's about. It, it, with the blockchain in particular, it's particularly smart contracts, it, it is all about you know, pre and post bankruptcy, where, where, what's the positioning? Um, and and if, you, if you don't have settlement finality, if you can't guarantee that you can uh, affect, you have the asset, the title is yours, then it's then it's worthless. Then it's just a database entry. Mm -hmm. um, so without that, you you really can't progress. Some questions around technology and building strategies. Um, are any of you thinking about green buildings? That's probably something that comes up quite a lot in Europe, at least compared to the U.S. We're a little behind on the ESG side. Um, or smart buildings. How does that play a role in 
uh, your thoughts about portfolio management, uh, build to core, some other strategies? It is, it, is, it is a very big topic uh, at this mm -hmm. for, for European investors, that is sure, but not just. Uh, and uh, for us, uh, the, the objective of the EXA group is to have 70% per of its portfolio to, be, uh, uh, to benefit from uh, a good uh, label, a good rating um, uh, from the, uh, for, for, for ESG, uh, for a good uh, ESG rating. So, uh, so that is a, a, an objective uh, we have, but uh, it is uh, looking at uh, what our clients are expecting, it is more and more part of their, uh, their expectation. So the way for us to, uh, to, to, to deal with that is to continue to uh, do a lot of development. I have mentioned that it is, uh, from a strategic point of view, it is a very strong conviction we have that it makes sense, notably to embrace uh, new tenant demand, but it is also a way uh, to uh, develop uh, buildings that uh, are uh, very efficient from an energy uh, consumption point of view. So we have currently 9 billion under development, uh, and all the building, uh, so it's many offices, but it's also hotels um, and, uh, and logistics, uh, but at least for offices, uh, all of them will uh, be delivered with a, a grade A certification um, regarding uh, ESG, uh, ESG dimension and notably the energy. Uh, In all these mixed use developments that you're thinking through, um, how does smart buildings um, or the idea of integrated uh, portfolios play a role in your thoughts? Uh, major role, maybe just a quick comment on the ESG. So Canadians are very focused on this, particularly can Canadians from the West Coast and Vancouver. So uh, so this is, um, it, it's just taken for granted almost. It's not even a question anymore. I might know one thing though, is you don't get paid for it, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's no tenant that says I'll pay you an extra dollar because you're, you know, you've got an environmentally efficient building. At best, if you both cost the same, you'll get it. But even then, a lot of times, it's the traditional things that drive those decisions. You know, your location, you know, and the, the quality of the building overall and things like that. So uh, it's something that's happening more. I'd say more just because it's kind of mandated and the clients kind of expect it, but you don't get anything for it. Uh, in terms of smart technology, absolutely. Um, uh, one of the things that we've been in doing just to kind of inject uh, knowledge into our company is investing in small prop tech companies. Um, we actually teamed up with the city of Toronto and Microsoft to kind of incubate uh, small, uh, small prop tech technology companies in, in Toronto. Uh, we're, we're just starting on building a small portfolio. We're not putting a lot of money into it, you know. These things do, you know, initial offerings of 25 million, something like that. We put in 10%. So in our portfolio, the investments themselves aren't meaningful, but the knowledge that we get in working with these people. So for example, one company we invested into something called Honest Buildings. They have um, very um, sophisticated, um, uh, you know, um, uh, applications that they've built in terms of managing the massive mixed-use development projects that we like to get involved in, in terms of payment schedules and timing of, of cash flows and things like that. So, um, so what, why we do that, though, is, is that when we're working with them, uh, we work with them, they can adapt their applications and tech software to our particular needs. Um, and then actually one of the things, too, we work with other groups who are also very active in, in this area. So we'll get maybe, you know, the, if, if they have, you know, 15 investors, maybe six or seven of us, which were strategic investors, will invest in these companies, utilize their software, in effect, actually make them successful by doing that, but then help ourselves. So the benefit we get out of it is more from how they help us improve what we do than the actual investment itself. Even if we get a 10 multiple on it, it's not going not gonna to move the needle. Can I just tag two things that are happening that you might be interested in about? So one is the Brooklyn um, blockchain initiative, which takes folks with solar power. Um, the assumption is that electrons will go to the first place that they can. They can. So if you produce more power than you consume, your neighbor's going to end up paying for your bill. And actually, that works quite, it's within two, two streets in Brooklyn, which is quite interesting. Um, and then uh, the, the second piece was of a firm that I, I worked with that looks at um, client segregation accounts, um, which are quite hard to do in the US apparently. Um, for if, you're, if you own a building and you have a number of tenants, um, receiving that cash and doing all the administration around mm. you know, who put the money in and when, actually all done completely on the blockchain through effectively digital wallets, um, which is another interesting way to kind of smooth out the process and make it more efficient. 
We're unfortunately running down the clock here, so I would like to ask one more question for all of my panelists. I'm sure you can bother them after um, during coffee with the questions that I didn't get to here. Um, one property type or geography that you would love to invest in and one thing you just won't do right now. So I'd love to just go down the line and hear your quick answers. Dennis, let's start with you. So uh, along the lines of the fact that we think that really the one true growth opportunity of of this time and, and for, for the near future is technology. We're very focused on the hard assets that we can invest in in technology. So we're very focused on data centers. You know, we're kind of, you know, worrying in the back of our uh, mind if, if that could change, but, but certainly right now the growth of data is massive. You guys have heard statistics like 90% of the data in the world has um, been created in the last two years. And, you know, uh, data centers are the heart of the internet. So we're very focused on data centers, think it's a great opportunity. As a real estate player, infra, because a lot of LPs I'm talking to don't know where to put it right now. Yeah, well, we've, we've claimed it. So we, we <laughs> said it's real estate. So it depends the organization you're in. We defined it as real estate, so it's now real estate. So that, that's kind of a, a key area we like to focus on. We like to put a lot of capital in, and we'd like to do it globally, too. Um, we think that, um, you know, North America is very developed in that area. Europe still has a lot of opportunities, and Asia has um, even more. And then the things that, um, the, the other thing people talk a lot is the, you know, is, um, is um, a a aging and the population and everything like that. So senior housing is interesting. There's no doubt about that, but it's still too early. Um, people were planning on people going into retirement homes in their late 60s, early 70s. It's not happening. It's moving out a decade. So you've seen a lot of supply put in place, and it's just too soon. So we're not doing that right now, but we're looking at it very closely. It will be an opportunity, but not for a couple of years. Thanks. Isabel? Um, so we, we, we do a lot of alternative. It includes data center, and that's as long as we are managing real estate infrastructure, it's in the middle, so we have no issue. It's, uh, it's with, uh, with, with us. But uh, no, what we are doing a lot is everything uh, around residential and student housing and senior housing. So this uh, lodging theme is a, is a big one, and we are c currently deploying a lot of capital, notably in the residential sector in Europe and in uh, several countries in Europe. And uh, with this urbanization trend, uh, investing in the, in the big cities in Europe uh, ma makes perfect sense. Anything you don't want to do right now? Um, yeah, there's plenty of things we don't do. Huh? So, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have to be very, very selective. So we are, we are really focusing on a limited number of things, and there are a lot of things we don't do, don't want to do. So. Well, we're very focused on retail, as you would know, since that's what I've been talking about for the last hour. But it's really good to think about within retail. So we are very focused on high-end retail, A-grade retail here in the US, we think is a good opportunity. And particularly retail that has an opportunity to be improved further, for example, a B-grade asset that could be turned into an A-grade asset with some redevelopment. And interestingly enough, the sector that I wouldn't touch is the lower grade malls here in the US. So the C and D grade malls, we're projecting um, big income losses in those malls and repurposing as they just need to find something else to do with that land. Emmanuel, on the tech side, is there anything you won't touch, um, pitches you don't want to hear right now? <laughs> um, what I don't want to hear right now. Uh, anyone trying to sell me uh, operational services? Um, <laughs> Sorry, service providers. Yeah, I, I, I actually think uh, I, I steer away from anyone who's any from one of these large Indian um, outsourcing outfits. I think that will disappear over the over the long haul. Um, you know, if we're all sharing a back office on, on on in the cloud in a data center, we don't have to repeat the same work four times over. I wouldn't do that. Custody banking, I think it's a thing of the past in five, six years from now, five, five, ten years from now. Asset servicing, uh, I don't see that as a future as well. Uh, I, and a stat that I, uh, I was going to share with you guys, 92% of millennials um, don't trust banks. So I don't know what that says about banks, but it does say that we have to change the way, our, change our thinking and our, and our model. Uh, and I'd also say one more thing, millennials are uh, now at 26. Um, so they're just entering their peak earning years. Um, they are a cohort 25% bigger than baby boomers. So we're talking about the aging population. Um, and they're all digital. Uh, I would say that what's driving crypto is millennials. It's pretty hard to buy uh, up until Christmas when my mother wanted to buy Bitcoin. Uh, it was pretty hard to, <laughs> to buy Bitcoin or Ethereum, right? So you, you need to be tech savvy, driven largely by millennials. So you really have to rethink 
what it is you're trying to get done over the next, let's say their, their peak earning is 26 through 45, the next 20 years is going to be completely different and accelerated because you've got all these technologies coming together, AI, machine learning, uh, blockchain, all coming together as confluence. Please join me in thanking my panelists. Appreciate your discussion up here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great panel. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll take a 30-minute break, and then we'll be back to go to Mexico. So uh, please come back in 30 minutes. Thank you.